Well, this is, uh, as Oliver said, and Pamela has said, it's uh, open to anything. Any, you know, we can explore any subject or whatever. I will tell you what I know about it, if anything. So it's your day, not mine. Not mine to give a lecture. It's yours to ask questions. So I hope you have a long list of questions. <laughs> I have a follow-up question from today, uh, from yesterday. So, how come um, some people die of hunger and other don't need to eat? Some people uh, don't need to eat, right? And others die of hunger. Well, how come some can heal and others can, or some go out of body and others had a hard time with it? It's just a matter of whether or not you can. Utilize some of the the energy, the power within consciousness, or not. So it's not a it's not really a matter of they have different bodies or different metabolism or that sort of thing. There's not a physical answer as far as the difference goes. They both have bodies that uh, you know would uh, need the same sort of functioning except when that functioning gets overridden. So if you have a, enough of a connection, and if you can work at the being level, and if you can stay connected to the system to a point that the system lets, you, uh, lets your body go ahead and, and live, then uh, it works. It's a virtual reality. Anything can happen. So all the system has to do is let you go on eating, I mean, let you go on without eating. Just maintain your body. After all, what is your body? It's a bunch of data that comes from a computer. It doesn't, you know, the computer can make that body be however it wants. So it sends data down of a healthy body. Everybody looks and what they get is data of a healthy body, well then that's what it is. So in a virtual reality, those things really aren't that, that hard, but you have to have the cooperation of the rendering engine so that the rendering engine will always render your body healthy. So you can't do that without that cooperation. It's not something you can force the system to do. It's something that you and the system kind of have as partners can do. Just like me, uh, um, Getting a body in some other reality and walking around, I can't, I can't barge into that reality and do that on my own. The only way I can do that is if I get the rendering engine for that reality to put me in to the reality of the physical being in that reality. So that I have to have permission, if you will, and cooperation of the source to do that. So it's important. It's important to have, um, I guess the way I said it in, my, in the immersives is it's good to have a good working relationship with a larger consciousness system. If you have a good working relationship with consciousness, then there's all sorts of things that you can manage to do. If you don't have a good working relationship, then even things that you should be able to do, you might not be able to do. And the way you get a good working relationship with the LCS is to be serious about your own growth and becoming love and getting rid of fear and that sort of thing. So if you're on that path and you're able to uh, be helpful to others, if you're part of the solution and not part of the problem, then there's not a whole lot that you can't do if you want to. But if you would abuse that, say, oh, really, I'd like to, you know, teleport down to, uh, you know, Buenos Aires for the weekend and, uh, you know, party with it, whatever, then that would get you a lower status with the LCS because that's the wrong reason for going there. So if you do things for the wrong reason, then your good working relationship gets less good. So you have to you have to always 
do things for the right reasons and for the right intents, and then that relationship gets better. So if your intents are self-serving or ego-based, then you're not going to get put in another reality with the body. That wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen. So then you can feel better about those that come here with a body who aren't really from here. Not just anybody can, you know, can do that. You have to have a good relationship with the rendering engine to do it. So that's why some people can starve to death while others, because they have a good working relationship with the LCS. And the LCS doesn't mind doing those things because they kind of stir the pot for everybody else. They make everybody else think twice. Really? You don't have to eat? That's impossible. You know, the body won't work if it doesn't get fed. It's going to shrivel up. You know, you're going to lose weight. Eventually, you're going to drop over dead. So when the impossible happens, people pay attention and it impresses them. Like people can see without their eyes. See, that's, a, that's something that people say, really? I must be a trick, you know. So when they then put the put the bandages over the eye, you know, put the patch on, you can study the patch. You can put it on yourself and see that there's no light coming through it. And if you take all the those kind of precautions, so there is no other answer other than they can see without their eyes, then that's an eye opener. I think the uh, couple that was up there doing the tests and held the, held the cardboard mm -hmm. in front of them and so on. I think they found that as an eye-opener. They were, they were doctors, by the yeah, way. Yeah, they were physicians. And, uh, it, you know, it was the impossible. And when you see the impossible happening, your first thought is that there's a trick someplace. You know, because we see magicians doing the impossible all the time. You know, they saw ladies in half, you know, they, they do all sorts of things. And we know there's lots of illusions that can be done that look like something's happening that isn't really happening. So that's the first assumption. That's impossible, therefore, there must be some trick to it. So that's why it's good to get personally involved and have your own personal experience, because that's the only way you find out that it's real. And my question is about consciousness, mental space, and order. Uh, sometimes when I'm, you know, lying in bed or being relaxed and being sort of in twilight zone, in the transition between tw twilight zone and waking zone, uh, I sometimes see something people call tulpas. So this tulpa, it was uh, 2017, the 7th of October of 2017. It was about 50 centimeters in diameter, more than, say, bigger than this, yeah? but in this uh, uh, distance. And, uh, you know, I, they just, what is Aufschau? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for those of you who couldn't see it, it was circles with lines and then lines coming out from the lines. It's just a geometric shape. Yeah. It's a geometric pattern. Yeah. Kind of mm -hmm. almost yes. sun-like. Yes, and it was this color. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I just wanted to know what you think about that. And there's another tulpa I, I will show you. The, the other one was even more interesting because, you know, it was a geometric sh shape I couldn't draw because it is not possible and it was sort of this is only 2d but it was actually 3d uh, um, no no it was like 5d i don't know huh? <laughs> uh, and uh, these um i don't know uh, my question is they, I, I also see other sorts of tulpas sometimes they are not uh, that beautiful but black and chaotic no um, and uh, I, th I have, I think maybe when I went to this right there, yeah, this one. This one was uh, something that, which this is 2D. Yes. Let me hold it up here. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in later. Yeah. I'll edit oh. it later. Okay. This one is 2D, <laughs> but in 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 reality it was 
not possible as geometry, you know, you couldn't draw it. And it was a little bit smaller and, you know, it lasts about that always, two, three seconds and then it's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, it dissolves. And um, so sometimes I think um, the forms I see, maybe they depend on the status of my consciousness. You know, when I'm in a, a, a relaxed and cozy space and so the forms are like, like this. And if there is some irritation, even if I don't really know, but you know, I'm not really settled or so, some people think maybe they are black and uh, or, mm -hmm. or spiders or something like that. Not, not, not that it's not dangerous, of course, because I had to get used to that. Uh, seeing, you know, seeing a spider about this size <laughs> somewhere, but only two or three seconds, but uh, those beautiful forms, um, you know, appear more often. And um, yes, and if it's if it's you know as clear as that, I try to 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 draw. What do you think about that? What are they, and why do you get them? Yes. What do you think? <coughs> well, yeah. if you relate to them in some personal way, mm -hmm. like if you're not relaxed, they're more jagged, or I think so. More, so. Whatever, and if you're more relaxed or prettier and whatever, they could be a, a reflection of mm -hmm. your of your state. But put yourself in the position of the larger conscious system. Mm -hmm. Put yourself in the position of, of the rendering engine. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are consciousness out there and you have to send them data when they ask for data or when they're open for data. Mm -hmm. If they are just relaxed and they say, all right, what do I see? Well, you could give them just black so they don't see anything. But that really wouldn't be good because that would be kind of discouraging. Mm -hmm. right? So that wouldn't be a good thing to do. You have to give them something. They're not particularly asking for anything in particular. They're not particularly trying to do this or trying to do that. They just, what do I see? So what would you do? What would you give them to see? You see, you need to give them something. So you give them things like that. You give them designs, you give them structure. Um, you may give them things that help open their mind, things that pull them to, to think about it, to, to try to see more things, because just in seeing things, there's some mental discipline. So that's why it wouldn't be good to just give them black or white. Give them things to help them discipline their consciousness and their focus. Mm -hmm. um, but they wouldn't necessarily have any big underlying meaning. So everything you see and get isn't part of some deep mystery. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just because you ask for something. They give you something. Um, if it's a way the system can be helpful to you, they might give you things more helpful. But if you're just, we'll see, you're not really making any effort, you're not really having an intent to do something, just whatever comes, yeah. then the system just gives you whatever. And maybe here's some pretty designs. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> Another time it was a sort of whirly uh, jig, I think, or a spinning top, I don't know, roundabout, roundabout. A little small roundabout was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. A roundabout. <laughs> yeah. So everything you see when you are in an altered state, or meditation state, or connected to the LCS, it doesn't have a deep meaning. It doesn't have a great significance. It's just something because you ask for it. But you didn't ask for anything specific, no. or for any particular purpose. <laughs> so it was a kind of a, show me something. And. Uh, it keeps you interested, yes. and it keeps you practicing mm -hmm. getting in that state. Mm -hmm. So you say, oh, I wonder what I'll see today. Mm -hmm. You see, so now you're doing practice on that state, so it's good for you in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it probably doesn't mean anything in particular. Now, oftentimes you will find that other people will get very similar things. Often, 
the exact same things. You may run into somebody else and talk about that you see these things and they'll say, oh, I see that too. That doesn't mean that there is some deep connection between you or, you know, that there's, this is now part of a, a bigger plot. It just means the system has a template of things that it sends to people when they're not really looking for anything in particular that are somewhat engaging and will help them develop their mind. So it sends you and somebody else and somebody else and maybe thousands of people the same things because it already has those programmed and in a, in a slot, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the pinwheel geometric shape slot, you know, and let that send things to you. So it kind of can automate the process. I've had any number of experiences in the uh, out-of-body state and I found out later that other people have had identical experiences. Not similar experiences, but identical experiences. The only difference is that we don't always make the same choices. You know, sometimes they make different choices than I do, but as much as we can describe what we experience to each other, it seems like they are exactly the same. So that just makes it easier for the system. They don't have to think up something new to send you if they've already got something that they send people who are doing about the same thing that you're doing. So yeah, I would be surprised, I would, be, I would not be surprised if you ran into people that, that have the and even the system might even nudge two people who have the same thing together and kind of plan in their mind that they should mention it just so they find out that they get the same thing because that would even raise the level of interest and intrigue and wonderment a little bit that would uh, kind of energize them to keep, to keep working. So we are in a collective process, we are all in the same thing. Uh, so you think it would be useful to publish, let's, let's say, those tulpas and may, uh, maybe sure. somebody? Sure, somebody say, exactly. I saw the same if thing. If you publish yeah. those, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you probably will find people who have seen the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah. just seems okay. like that's more efficient. <laughs> it's more efficient for the system yeah. yes. to have templates of things that it does in situations rather than have to do a, you know, a one-off for every person. So yeah, I think that would be the interesting thing. Publish it and see what you get, mm -hmm. what you get back. And, uh, mm -hmm. Do you think it makes sense to you know? You can see I am doing the documentation as best as I can. You know, day, uh, date, no, um, let's say time, um, um, how I how, how I felt, maybe the the things that happened the day before, mm -hmm. or some intriguing things, or. Well, things I was interested in, or whether I, I was just in, um, you know, decent mood. <laughs> right. Yes. So, do you think this is useful too, or just the images? Well, you know, it could be a tool if you if you define meaning through images. Mm -hmm. If you set up a If you set up a, a, uh, a relationship between each image, say, and something, say, all right, when I get the little things that look like wagon wheels or pinwheels, then that is a sign of, um, uh -huh. you know, that's a, that's a good sign. That's the day I should go out and, you know, do things. And if I get these other little stubby things, that's a good sign that I should go back to bed. And you can make up a whole thing, a set of things like that, where you have assigned meaning to them. Mm -hmm. What you've done, you've just created a language, if you will, that the LCS can use to communicate with you. Yesterday you said, meaning is created. You said that yesterday. That I, I noted, down, uh, noted it down because you know, it was so important mm -hmm. for me that we make an experience, you know, the system sends us a sort of experience mm -hmm. and we create the meaning. Yes. So is this what you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. But with this, with symbols like this, you can actually create a language mm -hmm. with which the system then can talk to you. Mm -hmm. So if you have a language that is, uh, you know, fairly uh, complex, you know, the syntax and the, and the, and the uh, metaphors mm -hmm. are rich enough, then the system can 
communicate with you through that. Mm -hmm. You know how people uh, have these, these things, they say, well, send me a sign, you know. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be an auspicious day or not? You know, I want a sign. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just a very crude language that they've developed with their own belief systems about what sign, what particular signs mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just enables the system that it communicates with mm -hmm. you with that sign. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with um, um, tea leaves in the bottom of a cup or chicken bones that are thrown, you know, on the ground. Prognostication, you know, tell the future. Mm -hmm. Well, if you set up a, if you set up a system in which one, there is uncertainty if you're going to do something that's physical rather than something that's mental. Mm -hmm. Something that's mental like this, there's very there's not so many, not so many limitations mm -hmm. because you can just make your, your own language that then would be useful for you and then you can teach others. Mm -hmm. You can teach others, here's what these symbols mean and mm -hmm. others can use your language mm -hmm. too. It can spread around, the, lots of people can use mm -hmm. your language. This is how these um, these traditions grow up among, you know, people with long histories, you know, what do we call them, uh, indigenous people, I'm not sure just what the right language is, but people who have had a culture that's, you know, thousands of years old, and they've accumulated these things that people have created that worked, and then they expand on them, and they work, and they have this, you know, the shaman has this set of tools that they work with. Mm -hmm. But that's where those things come from. It's not like they're fundamental. You can, uh, if it's a physical thing, like throwing the chicken bones or stirring the tea leaves, then the physical thing has to be such that it has a lot of randomness in it. That way, when the bones get thrown, they could land in any number of ways. And if a language has been developed, it says, well, if they land in this way, it means this. And if they land in that way, it means that. Well, because of the randomness, it's easy for the system to make those bones lay any way it wants to, to give them a message. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much uncertainty into how they land, then it can render those bones in any position, and it's not amazing. You know, it's not like you've broken any rules here, because it's the fact that it's arranging the bones is invisible because of the uncertainty. The same with the I Ching. The Ching, you have a bundle of reeds and you let them go, and depending on how they fall, or you flip a coin and, and make a hexagram. But the hexagram has to come out of a random process, because it's a physical process. That's the key. If it's a random process and you have, what are the 64 hexagrams, 128 hexagrams, I don't know, there's some number, right, of hexagrams. 64. 64 hexagrams. And that's it. So that's the language. Okay? This is a language that has 64 you know, concepts in it. It's not necessarily words, but it has concepts in it, pieces of meaning. And as you flip those coins or drop those reeds or do whatever random process you do, the system can manipulate that coin, can manipulate how those reeds fall without anybody noticing that anything's been, you know, that any tricks are being done. And that way it can send you a message, give you that hexagram that you need today, you know, to help you understand what's going on. Okay, so the people who can get value out of this language are people who understand the language and have a, have a, um, have a kind of a commitment to it. If you say, Oh, bullshit, that's just ridiculous. Watch, I'll flip the coin and I won't see anything that's meaningful at all. And you flip the coin and sure enough, it doesn't see anything that's meaningful at all. So you're not connected to it. You're not involved with it. You're not a part of it. So in that case, you can do the I Ching or look at your tea leaves or do whatever. And even though you've got the even though you've got the uh, language, okay, if the tea leaves fall like this, this is what it means. If you're not a part of that process, it probably won't mean anything. So it's a, it's a shared thing. You have to be connected with the language. 
So you could develop your own language with this if you wanted and then ascribe meaning to it and then use it in that way. Mm -hmm. And if you put this up on, mm -hmm. on, uh, on mm -hmm. your site and you get feedback on it, mm -hmm. not only will you likely run into people that get the same things, mm -hmm. you'll probably run into some people who've done that, mm -hmm. who've subscribed particular meaning to it. Mm -hmm. You see, and if they have done that, then that, that's just theirs. Mm -hmm. You could subscribe completely different meaning to mm -hmm. the same symbols, mm -hmm. and that would be fine. You would have your language, they would have theirs, mm -hmm. and the system could work both. Mm -hmm. You see, so it's not like if they do it first, then you're stuck because they've already, they've already made a meaning for that. It's not mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. it's, you can make your own because the system will work with you with your language using those symbols and can work with somebody else with their language mm -hmm. using those symbols. Mm -hmm. So these are ways that we can create tools for ourselves to interact with the system. Mm -hmm. As a friend of mine, a lady who is a, a, a I was going to say a masseuse, but is a masseuse only the male form? What does a female who gives massages? Still, masseuse. still a masseuse? Masseuse. Is it just not, not, a, not a Mussolini? <laughs> Italian joke, right? <laughs> Anyhow, um, and she has a pendulum. She holds a pendulum. And if the pendulum rotates this way when she holds it, that's a no. And if it rotates this way, that's a yes. And she uses her pendulum to get yes-no answers from the system. So. But it's actually the system responding or it's the individual consciousness? It's the system. It's, it is you are consciousness. You and the consciousness are, are really a thing, one thing, you know, you're all part of the same system. So if, this, if the consciousness wants to work with her because she works with the system and she's trying to help people and the reason she's doing this is because she wants to know should she, you know, do this technique in the massage or that, and which would be the most helpful. And if she's trying to do things like that, then the system would work with her because she and the system are connected and have a good working relationship and she's made this language. It's a very simple language. It's a, it's a binary language, you know, yes or no, but it's information. So she will get her answers and what happens is that when you just hold up a pendulum, your hand doesn't stay perfectly still in space. It wobbles around a little bit because your muscles are like servo systems. This muscle pulls it a little way, but oh, that's a little too far. So then it pulls it back a little, and you're constantly wobbling around here. And whether that motion will cause this pendulum to rotate this way, and that is pretty random. It's very random. But nobody can look at your hand and say which way that pendulum should rotate by looking at your hand. Maybe if physicists set up a high-speed camera and you know, measured your hand, then that would take the uncertainty out of it, and the system wouldn't be able to use that tool. But as long as that measurement is not being made, the system can make that pendulum go any way it wants because it's rendering that pendulum. It's rendering the hand. It's rendering the body. All of this is being rendered. So it can render a pendulum going this way or that way. So if the right answer for her is a yes, you should do that particular work. She does mental work as well with, the, with people. Um, then the pendulum will go whichever way yes is. But somebody else can use a pendulum and use just the opposite for yes and no. If she's got a clockwise yes, they could do a clockwise no. And the system could work just as well with that, you see. There's nothing magic about the pendulum. It's just there's uncertainty there. There's randomness in which way it'll go. And within that randomness, the system can render it in a way that communicates with the individual. So my point is, when you think, get things like this, you can make tools out of them. You can create languages. You say, this is, this is what the shaman does. You know, he's got this long history of people creating symbols and what they mean. Yeah. Oh, I saw a snake with a bone in his mouth, you know. That means da 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 you know, I saw a wolf running and... So they to have these images of things that are part of their reality, they subscribe meaning to them, which creates a language that the system can use to communicate with them.
So that's how those things work. So I just mentioned it because you know, it's like, well, what can you do with this? Mm -hmm. yes. What's it good for? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. If you share it, you probably have people who see the same things, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. And you may have people who actually say, oh yeah, I've, I see that same thing and here's what it means. Mm -hmm. You see? But see, that just is what it means to them in their own language. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that that is its meaning. Mm -hmm. It's just the meaning for them. Mm -hmm. Just one follow-up then. I can later on follow But this was another thing I saw. This was in a dream. And this was the autograph of Pope Franciscus. And he said, <laughs> Uh, it was it was an autograph, and he, I, he, I met him in a dream, and he said, I, I asked him, give me an autograph, and then he said, of course I do, no? and then he started to write, six properties will be overcome, horror, intemperancia, and the other four, oh, I couldn't remember, and then he started to draw an autograph, which looked about like this, and then he signed about, Zermatt, na, na, München, Munich 2014. So, you know, what is it useful for? Should I publish such, such things? I, I, I'm getting, no, like 10 or 15 things like that from those people, uh, popes, presidents, and so on. Yeah. Well, the way to publish that, it probably is useful to publish it, but the way you would publish it, not as, this is what it is. This is so-and-so yes. signature. What is it? Yeah. Yes. But you should publish it in a sense as, this is what I got. Yes. And I got that this was, you know, this, day. this was, would you say, the Pope's, yeah. you know, this is what he said, and I, yes. I got that this day. But not from the sense that you're, you're telling them a fact, mm -hmm. as it is you're just sharing an experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. You see, mm -hmm. For, if from that perspective, then that would be fine. To mm -hmm. share those things. It's just what you get. Yes. It's personal. Okay. It's personal to you. Yes. You see, the data you yes. get is data for you. Yes. This was what was so interesting. You said the new uh, uh, Aufsatz, uh, the new uh, was heißt Aufsatz, essay. the new essay you mentioned, which appeared about uh, two weeks ago about the uh, the, the new thesis that the hologram is a sub subjective experience. Mm -hmm. You said that. Do you remember? Do you know what I mean? This this uh, essay which was published, you mentioned it yesterday. <laughs> there was a new theory, you know, yeah, fifteen was, people passed it to you. Yes, I remember that, one. but that was different. That was a ah. that was a physics experiment that was done. Yes. And that physics experiment was able to do I'm trying to remember the name of it, it was a thought experiment of Wigner's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eugene Wigner, mm -hmm. quantum mechanics founder. Mm -hmm. And he had a he had this experiment that would uh, demonstrate that reality was in the mind of the beholder, if you will, yes. or was was not objective. Yes, it's probably a better way to put mm -hmm. it that it was mm -hmm. not objective. Mm -hmm. That it was it was uh, that the observer mm -hmm. was an integral part mm -hmm. of the yes. of the reality. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. People had not until recently been able to actually perform the experiment. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to, to perform it. Mm -hmm. But they did, and they published. And the, the conclusion was that reality is not objective. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. same thing the double slit said. Mm -hmm. But this is just from a different direction. It has nothing to do with double slits. It's a, just a different way of of looking at things. So reality is, can we say, not defined mm -hmm. until, um, with a double slit they say, until the measurement is made, but mm -hmm. until some uh, consciousness gets that data in their data stream, yes. is really the way to say it. Because our reality exists not in itself, but only in the minds of the players. Mm -hmm. This reality mm -hmm. yeah. only yeah. exists in the minds of the players. Yeah. It doesn't exist someplace. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Only in the minds of consciousness, you see. So that's easy to understand with 
World of Warcraft or Sims. That's easy, right? That, that map, <clears throat> those rivers, those trees, those monsters, those elves and barbarians, where are they? So they don't exist anywhere. They only exist in the minds of the players. Mm -hmm. Data is sent to players. Players interpret that data to be the rivers and the trees and the monsters and the elves and the barbarians. And that's where that map exists, only within mm -hmm. the interpretation. And because we all interpret a little differently, there is no exact World of Warcraft map. <clears throat> There's only this kind of generally agreed upon map that all the players get because it's, the data is such that it's a multiplayer game. The data that's sent to person A has to relate to the data that's sent to person B. They have to be interconnected. It's interactive. So, yes, it's, so, uh, it's all in the, in the mind mm -hmm. yes. and you get a data stream mm -hmm. and it's your reality. Yeah. So when we talk about this world, it's a lot harder to see that this mm -hmm. world is only in the minds of the players mm -hmm. and that we're not a body, we're a player. And mm -hmm. what we're seeing here is our own interpretation of the data that we're getting. Mm -hmm. So because of that, that's what makes the world subjective. Mm -hmm. It's not really objective, which is what this experiment showed. Mm -hmm. It's because until data is sent to a player, it doesn't exist in this world. Mm -hmm. The only way information gets into this world is by being sent to a player. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the, what, uh, the observer paradox. Mm -hmm. You know, it's called that sometimes. How, why is it that the observer makes things happen differently? Why is the reality observer dependent? And of course, materialism doesn't like that at all because the world just is, it's a machine, it does what it does, and observers are irrelevant, but it's not like that. That's what the experiments keep saying. It's really not like that. It's the observer is key because nothing comes into this reality until some consciousness receives the data and interprets it. Mm -hmm. So it's, and in a sense, it's not really about the observer as it is about the information. When that information comes into our system, means some consciousness receives it, then that information represents something real within the system. Mm -hmm. So that's why in that experiment that I have, one of the experiments that I'm doing is I do the double slit experiment. I have the detectors detecting, sending the detected which way data, you know, out to the recorder but the recorder's turned off. It doesn't record anything. Okay, And my prediction is that that's the same as not collecting any which way data at all. So it's not the fact that the sensors collect the data. That sensor's not conscious. That does not put it into our reality. What puts it into our reality is that information becomes available for a player to read it, to look at it. That's what brings it into the reality. So if that information is collected by a, by a couple of sensors, but it never gets to a player's consciousness, then it's not in this reality. It doesn't exist. So that's why we have you know, particles that really aren't particles. They're not particles until information defining that particle is in somebody's data stream then you get a particle. Mm -hmm. So that's why when, they, when the detectors are detecting things and they're recording that answer, they're creating information. Mm -hmm. yes. That's also why when you have the, the um, delayed eraser experiments, that they work the way they do. A delayed eraser experiment is you do a double slit experiment and you collect the data, you record the data. So there it is. It's been detected, it's been recorded, but before anybody gets to look at it and see what it is, it gets erased. And that turns out to be just the same as not having any data at all. So it's not just a matter of detecting it. It's not just a matter of recording it. It's a matter that it has to be available for somebody to look at. Well, if it gets erased, 
then it's no longer available for somebody to look at. Then it's the same as if it didn't happen at all because it, nothing can come into this reality except somebody getting the information because that's what puts things in this reality. So my experiments are kind of centered around this concept and we'll see if they work or not. <laughs> you know, we'll see hopefully in you know, three or four months, five months, whether they work or not. But that's the idea. So that's a kind of a theory of why there is such a thing as a, as a uh, uh, observer paradox. Mm -hmm. And that's a solution to the paradox. So it's interesting that this other group of scientists doing this Wigner thought experiment come up with the, an answer that this is not an objective reality. It's the same thing. It's not objective reality. Now, they're not going to say the reality only exists in the minds of the players because they're not there yet. It's not that, you know, they're not going to see it that way or that consciousness has anything to do with it. It's just a big mystery. Now, in the early days of quantum mechanics, the scientists there were pretty much agreed that consciousness was fundamental because they saw the observer effect. And they realized that, that when the data was available to a consciousness, now a consciousness doesn't actually have to see it. If that data gets recorded, okay, that which way data gets recorded, and it's sitting there in that recorder, that makes it available. So the, let's say the, the experiments run automatically, and it's run at 2 o'clock in the morning, and everybody's asleep. And the detectors detect, the recorder records, well, that's going to produce the effect of the information is here. The fact that a consciousness hasn't woke up, gone, you know, look at what's in the recorder, that they haven't done that yet. Well, that's not the point. The data is available to consciousness. It can be looked at. That's really all that's necessary. It was available to a consciousness. It's there. Okay. That means you, that the data has to be so let's say that, that recorder you know, gets buried in a hole someplace. Well, your result of the experiment is still going to be that it's available to an observer. So because it's available to the observer, you're going to get the two spots, not the diffraction pattern. Even if nobody's looked at it yet, it's in a hole someplace. But if while it's in that hole, water seeps into it, and ruins all the memory chips, you know, and they all degrade and it's not there anymore. Well, then, if somebody looked at the result after that happened, the result would be different. It would be a diffraction pattern. But once somebody looked at the result and found those two spots because the recorder was somewhere and somebody could look at it, it's, then, you see, once somebody looks at the results, then it's done. Experiment's over. Those results aren't going to change later because of something that's done. But if nobody had looked at those results, then those results could be available to somebody to look at them and they'd get two dots. But because later it gets destroyed, if nobody had ever looked at the results, then the results would be different. Mm -hmm. But see, there's no contradiction there. There's no contradiction at all. So it's not as if the results changed. The results were always only potential results depending on what happens here, which is why we say reality is not objective. It depends on what we do, what we do with the, with the information, whether the information is available. But if it would be otherwise, it would be deterministic and not, <laughs> so to say, creative, you know, in a sense. It's what? When, when it would be otherwise, the reality would be deterministic, materialistic. Somebody else imposes it, right? Yes. And that's exactly right. So that's why science says that our reality is deterministic. And if it's deterministic, obviously there can't be free will because free will and determinism are logically antithetical to each other. So it has to be, you know, if it's materialistic, it's deterministic. If it's deterministic, there's no free will. If there's no free will, there's no consciousness, because you obviously can't make choices, and there's nothing to be aware of. It's just it's 
dead. Everything just is as it is, and that's it. And if there's no if there's no choices, then and there's no uh, free will, and nothing ever happens, nothing ever changes. Then there also can't be time, because time is all about change, before and after. So that's why you have the science has because they materialism is the only thing that makes sense to them. Oh yes, this is a physical material world. I'm sure the elf in World of Warcraft feels the same way. You know, because it seems like it's a material world and it's a it's difficult to understand it in terms of virtual reality. Then they start with that assumption. Obviously, you know, it's a material world. And then they get stuck with the logical consequences of that. And they get stuck with saying that it must be deterministic. Uh, well, that doesn't make sense. I make choices every day. I decide to do things all the time. Yeah. So that's silly. <clears throat> but they don't have a chance, they don't have a choice. They have to take that silly perspective because it comes along with materialism. And besides that, there is no consciousness, which is even sillier because it takes a consciousness to say that there is no consciousness. <laughs> And then that there, you know, there is no time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Well, of course there's time. So because this is so obvious that it's a material reality, scientists are stuck with three ridiculous viewpoints. It's deterministic, there's no time, there's no consciousness. And they will do their very best, and they're very clever people, to justify why that's so. They will make up theories and create some math and all sorts of things to justify those positions because otherwise they're obviously silly positions. They don't, as we say, that this doesn't compute. There is time, there is consciousness. So these things then, time and consciousness um, and free will have to be illusions of some sort. So they make models and come up with concepts to support that. But none of them are very credible. They're, they gain their credibility in science because it must be the right answer, because this is a material world. That's their, basically their credibility. So that's, um, that's the scientific view. You, have, you take the concept of materialism and you back yourself into a corner that doesn't make any sense. So if you're if in your opposite end, you see that you there is consciousness, there is time, there is free will, and then that takes you in a totally you know different place. But the, the the interesting thing is is you can make a model in either direction. You can have a, a materialistic model, and you can explain a whole lot of things, and then you can take the virtual reality model and explain a whole lot of things. So they look like they're just two different models, they are, but what makes a model or a theory um, good is how much does it explain? What's, you know, what can what can, can't you explain as far as the facts that we see, which means the results of experiments. So if you look at that and you'll see, well, materialism does pretty well. We've done reasonably well with materialism. We've gotten a lot of neat gadgets out of it, like all this electronic equipment, and all the things, you know, the construction here in this building, you know, it's, uh, we've figured a lot of things out, so materialism's been a pretty productive model, but it can't explain the double slit, it can't explain where that wall of plasma came from before the Big Bang, it can't explain consciousness, it can't explain time, it can't explain, um, there's lots of things, it can't explain this, this Wigner uh, you know, problem that it like that it's not objective, because in materialism it must be objective. Uh, it can't explain lots of things. It can't explain any of the paranormal things. It just denies that those things possibly exist, and anybody thinks they do, that's just a weak mind being led by belief. See, that's the answer to that. So there's all these things that it can't explain. It can't explain where time and spin and charge and mass, all of those things it can't explain where any of those come from. So if you look at the list of things it can't explain, it's actually a pretty long list. 
And on the other hand, the virtual reality explains all those things. So it would seem to be a better model. Well, that's kind of the logical position that I ended up with. I'm a physicist, you know, so I look at it and I say, you know, model, model. You know, I don't believe or disbelieve in, in any model. I'm skeptical of all models, particularly my own. Mm -hmm. But the way you decide how good a model is, is by the answers it can produce. So if it produces better answers, and there's lots of things in quantum mechanics that are, that are uh, uh, they call them paradoxes. Lots of paradoxes in quantum mechanics. There's a Zeno paradox. There's literally dozens of things that science is just going. That's the way it is. That's what the experiments say. It's a paradox, and we'll never know. Well, the difference is just looking at reality from a different perspective. If you look at it from the perspective of virtual reality, those paradoxes all disappear. So that's kind of where I am with my models. Not that I believe that my model is the absolute truth. You know, it's just that it's the better model at this point. New data comes in in the future, and we'll see. But at this point, it seems to me that it's a better model because it produces more of the, of the rational answers to the facts that are on the ground. It includes all the, the uh, subjective world as well as the objective world, whereas materialism only explains an objective world. That's it. Just the objective world. And any scientist will tell you, if it's not objective, it's not science. Anything that's not objective is woo-woo. Well, the problem with that is that the most important parts of our lives, the most significant things that ever happen to us, the things that are important, are almost all subjective. Mm -hmm. You see? The objective part is just the stuff, the props. You know, it's the props on the stage. But the actors on the stage who are, you know, interacting, that's all subjective. Love and caring and compassion and you know, interaction, all that stuff is all subjective. Attitude, feelings, it's all subjective. Things like, uh, you know, who you're going to marry and how many children are you going to have and what country you're going to live in, those are not things made, you don't make those choices based on a, you know, what we call it, deductive reasoning. Because you don't have enough facts. There's never enough information to make a deductive, logical choice in those areas. You never have more than a small percentage of all the information you know, who you're going to marry. Well, how might that work out? Probably could work out in thousands of different ways. You know, it just depends. So you just got a little bit of the data, so how do you make the choice? It's all subjective. Subjective evaluations, understandings, you see. So that's what real life is made out of. It's made out of subjective choices. Maybe and yet science says the only thing that exists is the, is, the, is the objective world. Well, they're leaving out the most important part of reality, which is all, you know, the, the soft stuff, not the hard Science and they just ignore that, like, well, that's all illusory. That's just, that's just, um, again, it's 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 an illusion. We just think that these, you know, the subjective world is just our imagination running wild, and none of that exists because we really aren't conscious anyway, and there is no time, and everything is deterministic. So it's just one big illusion, but yet it's the significant part of our reality. So this is another kind of silly space that science ends up in where they, they can't describe what's most important, only the stuff that's the least important. So maybe there is no objective uh, model or process, uh, process because it is a collective work in process and we mm -hmm. yet do not know yet where we end because we are creating it. Exactly. But see, they would say that, that uh, where we end is, if you knew, a physicist would tell you, well, 
maybe some of the younger ones wouldn't, but the, the concept in physics is that if you knew the state vector for every particle in the universe, because the universe is just nothing but particles, so if we have every particle in the universe and we know its location, its velocity, its temperature, you know, all the facts about that particle, that's what they mean by the state vector that defines the state of that particle, then everything we could compute everything that would happen after that. So all the rest of reality, all the rest of the future, all the rest of the interactions would be computable because this is just a big machine. And if you know how the gears and the rods and all the things are in a machine, you'll know what that machine's going to do because it's deterministic, you see. So that's their belief. But in the real world, as you say, we're creating this reality in our minds and with our choices and with our attitudes. And it could end up in a number of places. It's not deterministic at all. So, unfortunately, science paints it into a corner that is rather a silly corner to be in, with a lot of ridiculous things that just don't make sense to everyday experience. But they have to stand by that, because otherwise they have to give up materialism, and that's tough. They've been there, you know, since Newton, probably before Newton. So it's a really hard thing to let go of. And it's so obvious, of course we're in a material world. So, like I say, the elf feels the same way about his virtual reality. It's material. So the, the Sims characters, you know, I mean, the Sims characters now have gotten more modern. They go to discotheques and dance halls and have parties. And, the bartender fills the glass with beer and he slides it down the bar and the Sims character reaches out and grabs it and maybe you can bang it on the bar and it makes a noise, it doesn't fall through the bar. You know, it's all very physical. And those characters would swear that they live in a physical reality because it just works like that. I want to follow up on the pictograms as well. Uh, the first one uh, seemed to me to be like mandala, which are in uh, Orient most, and in Hebrew tradition and culture. And there is actually a language the Hebrew uh, works on with these pictograms to communicate with the ancestors, or with God, with Yah, the Yehovah, or whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. and, or to uh, transport themselves in time, but I'm not sure how this function. And the other one um, seems like to be the flower of life, it's called also a pictogram. And uh, the idea is that behind every object in this reality, um, there is a geometric pattern and a subtler pattern. And you can design, um, you can picture every uh, thing in this reality by this geometric pattern and also using something, <laughs> some magic, you can uh, de um, change the, ob the physical object by doing something to this geometrical pattern or whatever. Sure. And uh, Drunvaro Melchizedek is one guy who works a lot with this flower of life and so if you are interested. Yeah. Uh, so all, send me the link. Yeah, it all comes out of the same root. People you know, people have been able to explore inner space from the beginning of people, right? So, for as long as there have been people on the planet, there have been people who have been seeing things in their minds. And the system has been sending them data when they ask for data. So, it's not surprising that these things have collected and, and that uh, languages have been, up, been built up around them and symbols have been made and the thing is that people then tend to believe in their symbols. Their symbols become a belief system and their symbols become the way the world works and then somebody else's symbols are wrong and then they end up wanting to kill each other because of these attitudes, right? That's been the way religions and other things come up. The thing that they miss is that these symbols are just symbols. The meaning that they give to them and the significance they give to them are their own. But if they give an interesting significance to them, the system can use it to work with them. I think um, 
Reiki as a healing art has symbols. And those symbols have meanings and those symbols have to do with healing and so on. And, you know, of course you can heal without any symbols. You know, that's not necessary. But if you're within that group, then those symbols, of course, work. They're tools. Tools that you and the system can use to work together. You know, the problem is that when people see things like symbols, they create tools out of them, like you were talking about, particularly when people for thousands of years have been seeing similar symbols, is they begin to believe that the tools are somehow fundamental yes. and not just tools. And that's where the that's where the problem starts to come in when they think these things are fundamental. When they're I have a, they're not. a, a fantastic uh, example for that too because uh, two few years ago in my room appeared a sign like this, um, mm -hmm. and this. Um, yeah, I can see that one. That's big enough for me to yes. see. You mm -hmm. can show everybody yes. else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it, it appeared that like this. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was a, a rectangle about this size and those spirals were about 300, about 300 let's say. And this, like, because they were about this size in diameter and they were of poor, poor, and uh, lila. Uh, and violet. Violet, sorry, violet, purple and violet. And they were, you know, shining, as a shining. And this was about one centimeter deep. It was, you know, brilliant and shining. This and went into my room and it stood there and so on. And then, you know, I, of course, I was fascinated. It was in full wake state. Huh? Mm -hmm. And then uh, a few years later, I found that when you look at the tumuli in Newgrange in England or somewhere else, there are several tumuli where, uh, where, uh, which are also sundials. Huh? And when the, and, and the solstice, the sun stands and goes into the tumulus and the certain, we you know in the, in, the, in the peak of the experience, you know, the sun uh, shines and exact these symbols. And, you know, they are those stones, they are Stone Age. And though they, they had, you know, they sold these symbols too. Sure. And, you know, uh, this is, I, th I think, maybe the only difference between the Stone Age and 21st century is uh, I saw about 300 of them, and they saw only one or maybe 10. I don't know. Just, you know, it's just those, those things I would like to publish and if anybody else has an idea or has experienced the same thing, yeah. no? Yes. Yeah, you see, the, the reason that it works that way is that, like I said, you, people have been able to explore inner space from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So when the Buddha sat under his tree exploring inner space, he had all the same advantages that you have, yes. sitting wherever you are in your room exploring inner space. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the way it is in manipulating the physical world. Mm -hmm. We're so much better at manipulating the physical world now. It's like those Stone Age people look like, you know, ignorant savages, right, compared to what we can do with our modern technology. So we see that we're so much more advanced than they are. But we're not any more advanced than they are, nor do we have any advantages over them when it comes to exploring inner space. Mm -hmm. So they were able to explore inner space with the same success or lack thereof as we can. Mm -hmm. Actually, they probably had an advantage over us in exploring inner space because they were more like the five-year-olds we're talking about. Mm -hmm. yes. They didn't have all of this. That's impossible. You know, that couldn't mean anything. This world is objective and you know, they hadn't developed the science and the technology to make much of this stuff seem impossible. So if anything, they were advantaged in their exploration of inner space. They could go places and, and deal with ideas without running into beliefs that told them to, that that was ridiculous. So they're probably advantaged, maybe even as much advantaged 
in that spaces. We are now advantaged in the physical space over them. So yes, you have lots of people who were very capable to explore inner space, maybe more capable than we are now, in the sense that they have fewer beliefs to limit them. So it's not surprising that you go back mm -hmm. to when people were scratching things on cave walls and find that they had an understanding of the bigger picture that we are still struggling to understand today. You know, so yes, the Buddha 2,500 years ago said this is a, this reality is an illusion. Well, he couldn't have said it was a virtual reality because that, that concept wasn't invented yet. But uh, these understandings have been around a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And we're just rediscovering a lot of them. And we have trouble with them because they are so counter to the beliefs we've taken on with no time, no consciousness, no free will. Mm -hmm. You know, science is the, is the truth. And but maybe he couldn't tell his experience virtual reality because the virtual reality, as we experience it, was not there. Exactly. Because it's now, 21st century, it's here. Right. It's existing, but when Buddha lived, it was not there. Right. Same with Einstein. Yes. When Einstein and Wigner and, and um, you know, all of those guys uh, doing quantum mechanics, had virtual reality been a concept then, they would have probably jumped right on it because they knew it was information, they knew it was conscious. I mean, they had all the, the basic facts but they didn't know how to put that in a context that made any sense. You know, there's a letter that's kind of famous, I think I quoted it in some of my, my uh, presentations, where Einstein and Baum are exchanging letters, and basically Einstein says, yes, I know that conscious is fundamental in this. You know, that's the observer, has a fundamental part of it. But he says, I have no idea what fundamental concepts or principles or mathematics to integrate consciousness, you know, into the equations. How do you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So they were stuck because virtual reality happened 75 years later and didn't actually get going until more like 100 years later. They just didn't have those ideas. Those were very bright people and they were very open-minded. They were, they were really excited about, you know, a new perspective but they couldn't come up with one because computing a reality was not known because there weren't any computers computing, not to the extent that they could imagine that a reality could be computed. It just wasn't there. A decade from now, two decades from now, that this is a virtual reality will seem like a trivial idea. Gee, those people must have been dense. That's so obvious, that's what people will think, you know, 20 years from now. See, that's so obvious, why couldn't people get that? Of course, it's a virtual reality, it makes a lot of sense. Look, it answers all, this, all these mysteries. So, but now we struggle with the, with the concept, so that's true. It just didn't have the idea. So the Buddha gave his best description of it that he could say it's an illusion. It's not real. It's not the real thing that matters. Yes. Since a few years, I had three times I had a dream about apps. You know, those apps. You know, what they are able to do. And I saw those apps, who, how they made their data mining, intelligent smart data mining in all the data pool we had, and which products they they produced for everybody having on his smartphone. And the first, um, the first app I dreamed was uh, um, an, an, a portal for, for techni technicians and inventors, uh, uh, functioning a little bit like Facebook. And the, the result of this app would be that every uh, patent ed agency and everything would be <laughs> a piece of yesterday. Uh, then I dreamed about an app which will, would um, um, collect all the data of space 
uh, surveillance and uh, um, um, identify everything which is there and just filtering out the, the things which are not uh, explainable sort of uh, UAP, so you know, I you don't know what I mean, I, uh, not the UFO subject, but things which fall out of everything. And I saw how those uh, apps were data mining in, in all those uh, meteorological, you know, military, every, every data stream which is available. And only a few, two weeks ago I saw an, an app which uh, visualizes um, the building process all over the world, uh, the, the data of geological um, research, the data of property, uh, um, you know, people who own the spaces, the, 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 um, the, where the building material is located, located and how big it is. Every, all those data are collected in one big tool uh, and then, if you want to build a house, yeah, you say, I want to build a house over there. Then, uh, the, you know, the ecolog ecological impact, what this um, project would be, is you can see it. Yeah? And you can see with the materials, what you need will come from. Yeah? And do you, you can, you know, do you can see the process. Uh, what it means all over, you know, in the in the in the global field, I would say, in the global field, and of course, those uh, if you if you look at those um, tools today, they seem impossible because uh, the data the, the 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 data pool of these uh, uh, tools would be uh, one of um, governments and then private sector, and then university sector, which are data pools which are strictly separated now, but they have to be put together to get those, you know, uh, monitoring of this uh, uh, activity, global activity, because, you know, of course we have to be very, very careful with our planet. <laughs> yes. yeah, well, so you are, you are uh, looking at the probable future, it would seem. Yes. <laughs> And it will probably go that way because you know we're evolving, and evolution is always moving to lower entropy states, yes, yes. more efficient yes. processes. I can so, see that. So eventually, tools. we will develop those sorts yes. of tools. Yes. We'll develop that kind of yes. cooperation. Yes. We will evolve ourselves. It all has to evolve together. Yes. You know, until we, until we, the humans, evolve the quality of our consciousness. Mm -hmm then many of these other things are impossible. Mm -hmm. Because all we'll do is fight and try to steal each other's stuff and you know, act badly like we, like we do today. You know, and we won't be able to cooperate on a level yeah. to do that. But eventually, we will, we will evolve there. Mm -hmm. We will do that. Yeah. And we will have the tools to optimize and make yes. efficient. And the evolution will, will uh, yes. present us with an environment mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. not only caring, mm -hmm. but one in which we have maximum amount of mm -hmm. individual freedom mm -hmm. to yes. do and to create and yes. to be whatever it is we want yeah. to do and create and yes. be. It'll be a, a place, you know, a lot of people have this idea that yeah. the collective, if we all get together and there is kind of a mm -hmm. cooperative collective, that that's terrible, you know. A collective is a thing that mm -hmm. takes away everybody's freedom and it becomes this big social machine and everybody's a cog in the machine. But that is a collective based on fear. Mm -hmm. You see? That's not an evolved collective. That is a fear-based collective. And if you've got a bunch of people today who are very fear-based and made a collective, they tend to work out that way. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, whoever's in power tends to you know, abuse whoever doesn't have power. That's yeah. kind of the way our social mm -hmm. systems work. Mm -hmm. Well, that's only because it's a fear-based system. Mm -hmm. When we grow up mm -hmm. and that collective us is a love-based system, yes. mm -hmm. then it does just the opposite. Yes. Everybody gets liberated. Yeah. Everybody has yes. the maximum amount of freedom mm -hmm. to be and do whatever they want to. Because everybody wants to be responsible. 
but if he, he doesn't have the information to be responsible, he can't be responsible. So the, the, the example with what, which I saw, it was somebody wanted to build a house, and then he said, I need 10 tons of sand. And then he said, automatically he saw this, where the sand would come from. You know, the, the system, the artificial intelligence, everything computed where this, the sand for his project would come from, and he saw the area where the, the sand was t uh, taken, and how the, the area would like would show would be after his stand was taken and then he could make his choice. Do I want to do this or do I don't, don't not want to do this? Mm -hmm. This is what, really I saw that. Really it was the app. I saw that in my hand and you know everything appeared on the device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You wait for it. <laughs> what? You wait for it. <laughs> you know, no I don't wait for it. <laughs> no. You know this is what you say it's a creative process. We are creating it. Yes. We're so creating. we have to do it. And we have to grow up yes. and all of this will just take place yes. naturally. Yes. We have because to Because it's more efficient. Yes. And more effective have, for mm -hmm. our growth. We have to realize what I see as data stream, we have to bring it into reality, you know? Bring it from NPMR into the physical world. This mm -hmm. is what we have to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Will we grow up to a point where we get a society like this where everybody this love and sharing, because you also said that new bewus signs, new consciousnesses are constantly coming in. Yes. We are not that it evolves. So will we uh, get to this <laughs> place eventually? Yes. yes, we will, because the new consciousness that comes in will be influenced by the consciousness that is there. Mm -hmm. And if that consciousness that is there is caring, and loving and efficient and all of that, this new consciousness that com comes in will grow to that very quickly. Mm -hmm. It won't necessarily come in at that level, but it will it will grow to that. It will become that. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just like you know, in in um, you know, we know that if we're part of a mob, everybody in the mob would be better than the mob. In other words, the people in a mob do things when they're in that mob that none of them would do as individuals. Okay, mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of angry people, all that anger tends to build. It's a collective consciousness thing and tends to drag people down to the lowest common denominator of what makes up the mob. The exact opposite thing also happens. When you're around a bunch of people who are loving and caring, you feel lighter. You stop complaining so much. You see, you know, reality seems to get better and nicer and the collective consciousness helps pull you up to that level. Now you still have to make better choices, but it's so much easier to make better choices when you're surrounded by a lot of very positive people. You see, and it's so easy to make bad choices when you're surrounded by a lot of angry people. So the new consciousness coming in will come into a collective consciousness that is very supportive and, and uh, very helpful, and it will grow more quickly as far as its quality goes. But it will also depend on, on which frequency the, the new uh, consciousness has come in, because uh, if that comes too many, then, uh, do you know, it has, we have been here for a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, we did actually develop, yes. Yeah, we actually did develop. Mm -hmm. uh, but if... Um, if all the people who grow up, they leave the system, or you know, then then they will always say uh, it will ne we will never reach it if they leave uh, those people who grew up and new come in, maybe in a bigger percentage than the ones yeah. leaving. Sure, that would be a, that would be the case. But see, look at from the system's perspective, it's creating an entropy reduction trainer here, okay, and we're supposed to be reducing our entropy and growing the quality of our consciousness. So how is it going to keep the system as effective as possible? Well, if we are able to grow up, we have to do that on our own, right? And we have to struggle. This is a struggle because it's not like we have a bunch of wise people that dominate the society that help us all grow up. We have to fight our way 
up this ladder ourselves. There's no other way to get there. So, but when we get there, the system could easily then bring others in from other systems that aren't that evolved yet. But not to the point that it drags this one down, but just to the point that it's just the optimum for mm -hmm. helping others grow up. You see, so the reason that what you're concerned about doesn't happen is because there's this executive branch that is in charge. And they're, they are trying to make it as efficient as possible. <clears throat> so it would be used in that point. Now, have I ever been to such a place like that where it's mostly uh, very grown? Not like that, no. So we are still, we as, as uh, individual units of consciousness, we're still in the beginnings of trying to drag ourselves up by our bootstraps. That's the place we're in. We're not at the point that that uh, most of us have already made it and we're just helping pull up you know, the new ones that come in. We haven't gotten to that point yet. And exactly how the system will, will treat that, what they will do with that, I don't know. But we're not there. An interesting thing about that, and it may be a good reason that we're not there yet, is that this whole growing up thing isn't as old as it might look like. Um, isn't as mature as you might think it is. The larger consciousness system itself had to also grow up. It didn't start growing up. It didn't evolve and say, oh, love is the answer and I need to be loved. Because that's not the way consciousness evolves. That's not the way it starts. It starts with a sense of I, right? A sense of ego. I am aware. I am this monolithic consciousness I make choices, I'm making patterns. Uh, I'm an information system, I succeed by lowering entropy. But in its mind, what is lowering entropy? Well, in the beginning, it's making patterns, and patterns of patterns, and so on, and then time, and then sequence of patterns, and it grows, it evolves with complexity. And as the complexity grows, the number of choices grow. So in the beginning, choices were very limited, this way or that way. And only two choices, perhaps, a binary, but that keeps expanding and expanding, and then, like I say, a sequence of patterns of patterns, and sequences of sequences of patterns and patterns, and it gets more and more complicated, and more and more meaning, and the, the patterns start to be given, they're symbols now, the patterns that have meaning and content related to them. Well, when it got to the point that it realized that it was kind of getting asymptotic, you know, the curve kind of goes, I'm growing fast, growing fast, but no, not so fast, not so fast, and it gets slow. Because you've kind of saturated, your decision space isn't big enough to keep you challenged. You kind of used up your decision space. That's when it decided that it would create more decision space by dividing itself up and interacting with other things with free will. Because the interaction from free will to free will has so much unknown because you don't control it all. A monolithic thing is in control of everything. It's very limited. It only is limited of what it can think of. Another free will has another perspective. And a whole lot of other free wills has a lot different perspective. And suddenly the decision space is enormous because you have hundreds of thousands of free wills all interacting with each other. So you've created this space in which you can grow into. Well, when the larger system got there, the larger system wasn't grown up. This was just the larger system's first experience of being in a social system, not being the monolithic one thing. So it had to deal with the, so with the, with the IU, IUOCs. And the way it dealt with them is the same pattern that we're going through. First it said, all right, all you IUCs, line up. Here's what we're going to do today. You know, and it started with force, with orders. I'm the boss. You're my minions. And this is what you need to do. You need to act like this. You need to do this sort of thing. And, of course, these individual units of consciousness hadn't developed at all yet. They were also very self-focused and self-centered. And they said... No way. Big 
guy, you know. They didn't cooperate. So then you have a, basically power struggles and things going on. So go back in history, which is not that far back. Go back just in our earliest written history. And what do you have? You have jealous and angry gods that are struggling with the people, demanding that the people do what they're told. And if they don't do what they're told, turn them into pillars of salt, right? Uh, you know, whatever. Flood, you know, flood them out, you know, that sort of thing. So you have this struggle going on. Well, it was through that interaction that the larger consciousness system grew up. It eventually realized that every time it tried to force or push, it got worse results than if it hadn't done anything. And all of that was non-productive. And it learned, just as we are learning slowly, through trial and error, what works and what doesn't. And it got to the point that it realized that love was the answer. And that to try to push, to try to demand, to run everything as the boss, was not helping anybody grow up. All it did was create anger and people pushing back and doing the opposite thing that it wanted. Right? It's like we were all teenagers. You know, it created that kind of a reaction, and that's what you got. You got dysfunction. Well, so it learned its lesson. All right, it's a hands-off. I got to let them grow up on their own. Yes, I'll give them guidance. I can give them some help, but I can't override their free will. That free will is, is a sacred thing that I have to let them make all their own choices. And it's going to be a slow ride. If they just do what I told them, you know, we could all get there a lot quicker, which is the way parents feel about their teenagers, right? <laughs> if you just do what I say, you wouldn't make so many mistakes, and you could grow up and it would be a whole lot easier. But you see, that doesn't work. People have to make their own choices. And as much as the parents try to order the children's lives and force them to do what they think is right, the kids do the opposite. And it makes the kids neurotic, it makes the kids unhappy, and it's dysfunctional, it doesn't work. You don't raise good children by forcing them to do what you want. So the system figured that out, that pushing us around wasn't going to work. I demand, you know, you do what I say. So it grew up. We haven't done that yet because now we're all interacting with each other. We're all trying to interact with each other, and we're all doing the same things. I know best. If you just all listen to me and do what I say, everything would be all right. But everybody feels like that. And we're all trying to manipulate everybody else to do the right thing, which is, means our way, what we think is the right thing. And it turns out to be chaos. It doesn't work well. And we're self-centered, and we're greedy, and it's all about us. And if you've got stuff and I want your stuff, then, well, if I'm bigger than you are, I'll just take your stuff. You know, right? Might makes right. So, law of the jungle, you know, that sort of thing. Well, that's where we've been. But we've been making progress. We're doing better than that now. Yes, but is the, is the larger consciousness system uh, uh, it creates the IUOCs, but uh, it's in control of how yes. many IUOCs it puts in and how many yes. it creates. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yeah, it's in control mm -hmm. of that. Okay. Um, so it's pretty much in control of the whole thing. And the reason that it, uh, you know, so you can see that it created the virtual reality trainer for IUOCs to play in before it was grown up. Because we were playing in this reality, in this virtual reality, and we were still struggling with, you know, Daddy who was trying to force us to his will. And we said, no, we weren't doing that. So that was going on while this trainer was still here. So it's not like that all that happened billions of years ago. It's not that way at all. Us growing up is still not that far back in history. What? Humans walking around 200,000 years ago. Well, 200,000 years is not long at all, considering the, you know, how long things have been crawling around on this planet. It's the last eye blink in history. 
So you see, okay, we're not very evolved yet, but we haven't really been working at it that long, and we've been struggling. And the neat thing about growing up is that the more you grow up, it is easier just to grow up more. So the growth curve it's like starts out real slow and real slow, but then it goes like that. And we're right there about that curvy point where it goes up. At least I hope so. <laughs> that, 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 that point where it starts to go faster. But if you look at, at our, what our recorded history is, the experience that people had and the kind of interactions they had and the level of the quality of their consciousness from 200,000 years ago up to, say, 2,000 years ago, that's most of the time, right? Not much changed. Everything was about the same. You know, from decade to decade, to century to century, there just wasn't a lot of difference. Next century was just like the last century. You know, people herded their sheep or dug in the ground or did whatever they did, and so did their children, and so did their, you know, great, great, great grandchildren, and whatever. There's very little change. And the basic model was a warlord model. People grouped together for protection, and there was, there was a leader, and that was the warlord, and everybody else was the, the serf or the peasant, and they fed the warlord with their labor, and that's the way it worked. And the warlord would protect them from other warlords who would like to have their stuff and their land and whatever else. So that was the model that grew up, and that was the model that everybody lived with for a long, long, long time. And you only have to go back like 500 years before that model started to break apart. But once that model started to break apart, things started to change. So you can see that, that rising a little faster probably was four or five hundred years ago that it started to go. So it's been increasing. But I'm hoping that we're going to start getting into this faster thing in the next couple of decades. So you see it can change quickly. We don't have to have another, you know, thousand centuries, you know, another millennia to get there. We don't have to do, we don't have to wait that long. It's going to get faster and faster. So this vision that you see of the future could only be a century away. You know, it, it doesn't have to go on forever. So I see now, we've gone through all these periods where it was always the warlord was the, was the, the idea. And sometimes those warlords were, were uh, kings and sometimes they were popes. You know, sometimes it was religious and sometimes it was civil. And of course those two fought with each other as well. Mm -hmm. So it was all kinds of, you know, warlords that uh, basically ruled with power and force. And when, you know, if you look, try to think when did that really start to end, seriously end, you wouldn't go back that far. But you, it's pretty recent history that that model ended. And now we went through the, the period where the, where the high priests were high priests of religion and they defined truth. Then we moved to the scientific world where it's total materialism and the high priests of science tell everybody what's the truth. But now science has gotten to the point where the truth is that this is not an objective world. The truth is, you see, we hit the we hit the first sign of that. That first bump in the road was 1915 to 1925, double slit experiment. That was the first bump that the you know that the scientist got that said double slit experiment. That it's not material. It's it's uh, not an objective world. And they've had their heads in the sand ever since because they haven't had the concepts to deal with it. Now they do. And as they do, it's starting to change. So as the concepts change, people's worldviews will change. So I see us now at this point where the scientists are the ones saying, you know, materialism is wrong. There's another component here that's important. The subjective is really the fundamental thing and this objective world is just a subset of that subjective world. It's a subset where the, where the uh, uncertainties are small. That's all. You have this whole world that's objective and subjective, and that subset of it 
where the uncertainties are very small, that we call the physical world, the objective world. Everybody measures this, they'll get about the same answer, because there's very small uncertainty about those things. Everybody does something like, who are you going to marry? Well, they're going to, there's a lot of, a lot of room there. It's not too narrowed down, you know, it's not, it has lots of uncertainty in it. Well, that's the subjective world. So the objective and subjective can just be defined in terms of how much uncertainty there is in a process or in a thing. But it's all subjective. So that's kind of the big picture of where we're going and why we haven't, you know, why haven't we gotten there yet? It's not that old that we've actually been, you know, on this path. And we have to drag ourselves up by our bootstraps first before we can help pull up anybody behind us. Um, as a parent, I'm still struggling with the um, respecting the free will of, of, of my children. I mean, I, I know you talked yesterday about uh, the computer game issue, um, but um, I, I'm wondering also, uh, I mean, at some point they're not grown up enough to right, let them do everything, like, like food-wise, if I would let them decide what they eat, it would be like bread and, and chocolate cream every day right. for breakfast and <laughs> right. dinner. Exactly. So at some point you have to say, like, no, you had it for breakfast, that's it for the day. But um, then you have to deal with this counter-reaction you just mentioned, like, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that because I don't like it. So, so how, how, how is their way or, or helping like cleaning up the house, like the leaves right, in order of falling down and, and you have to take them and, and, and to the trash so, so that the street doesn't cover it in them. And of course they don't want to help voluntarily uh, to, to right. or clean it up. So, so what would be a good way to make them do it without kind of like forcing them to do it? Because right. right now my best option is to say like if you want to keep your cell phone then you just do it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there must be a better way. There is. And it's not, you know, it has to be age appropriate and age specific. Obviously, very young children need to be taken care of. You do need to make their choices for them, like what they eat, you know, where they play. Again, the same example, you, you know, if you live on a busy street, you put up some kind of barrier, or you don't let them go out of the house unless you go with them. You know, you make the rules. No, you cannot play on the street. And if they go play in the street anyway, then you don't let them out of the house or you put up a fence and a gate and put a lock on it so they can't play in the street. So you have to be in charge of them when they are unable to make a good choice. But, but that's protection, so then it's easier. Yeah, that's, that's protection. Yeah, you, gotta protect, you have to protect to them. But when it comes to things like cleaning up their room, doing things like that, children need structure. Structure makes them feel safe. If they live in a world where anything, anything goes, that's a scary place to live. That's not a very, you know, we feel comfortable and safe with repetition, with things we're used to, when we know what's going to happen, when we have confidence that things are going to be in a certain way. And children respond very well to that sort of discipline. I'm Where? sorry, not necessarily. I have too much structure and too much too much repetition can harm exactly. a child. Too much can, yeah. but just the right amount is what we want. <laughs> See, you have to do it specific to their age and to the child. It's not just that every child that's five years old gets treated in a certain way. It depends on the individual children. And, of course, the children that are most difficult to raise are the children who are the most bright. The brighter they are, the more challenging they are to raise. But anyway, but anyway, uh, so when, they, when they're to the point where they have an ability to make choices that are not going to be dangerous to them, but they can choose, then you try to set up situations where they can make those choices and if they can make choices, they have to accept consequences. Choices should always come with consequences. You make good choices, then generally the consequences are good. You make poor choices, the consequences are, are not good. So you can decide for the child themselves, 
they need some structure. They need to know that you're taking care of them in the sense that you provide the structure and it's a safe structure. If you want them to grow up and be more orderly or even to think more orderly, to have a more orderly uh, um, approach to life, then you need to require some orderliness. They may have to keep their room picked up or straight to a certain extent, but you can't make them into little adults. Okay, so if they play and mess up their room, fine. They got toys and they're thrown all over and the floor is totally covered in toys. That's okay. But before you go to bed, all that has to be cleaned up. You know, everything, has, everything has to be put back in a box. You know, this sort of thing. And every box has to be put back on the shelf. And those are the rules. And then there's consequences. Or the toys that are left on the floor my daughter does this, the toys that are left in the floor will be thrown away. That's what she does. She says, if it's left on the floor, and I come in the next morning or whatever, and there's something on the floor, she throws it in a bag and takes it down to Goodwill and gives it away. It's gone. So if you want to play with this toy tomorrow, you better pick it up, put it in the box, and put the box back where it belongs. And she doesn't fuss at them. And if they leave the toys out, she doesn't fuss at them. She just picks the toys up puts them in a bag, they're gone. So it's a child's choice. There's consequences to life. You put your toys away or you lose your toys. And it works. Well, they have toys they like, and of course they test it in the beginning. They say, yeah, right. <laughs> you're going to buy those toys and then you're going to throw them away, right? And you have to be able to be firm. So yeah, okay, you paid $100 for that toy, right? and they let it on the floor and they'll do that on purpose. They'll take the most expensive toy in the room and set it on the floor and see what you're going to do about it. But you pick it up, you put it in the bag, you give it away. And they will, you know, and they don't, you don't replace it, you know, the next day. It's just gone, period. Maybe in six months or a year or the next Christmas or whatever, they might get it again. Give them another chance. So it's just one of those things. So you make rules and you have consequences for the rules. You don't get upset, you don't holler. You tell them, here are the rules. Here is what's gonna happen. Here are the consequences, it's your choice. What do you wanna do? And then let them make their choice. So if you can configure things like that to where they have a choice. So you've enabled them to not be bossed around or told what to do, because that they resent but they have a choice. Not necessarily the choice they'd like, but you're in charge, that's the choice. And that tends to work. And they feel more secure if you give them, if they know what the rules are, they will be happier, more satisfied kids than if they don't know what the rules are and it's this constant testing, what can I get away with, where's the boundary, Okay, that was a boundary last week, but is that still the boundary today? And most of these boundaries change, and they're different from day to day, week to week, so they never really know exactly what they can get away with and what they can't, and they're constantly testing. That builds up the mindset of them against you. You know, now you're, you know, now they're like in a game with you, and it's the, it's, it's the me against you kind of thing. How can I manipulate you? And you're thinking, how can I manipulate them? And you get into this situation, and that's not... That's not so healthy for the younger, younger kids. Now, as they grow up and they become, you know, seven or eight, well, you raise the ante. There's more choices that they have. So the older they get, their, their decision space gets bigger and bigger as they show an ability to choose well. So when, as long as they just leave their toys out and you start young when those toys are, you know, $10 bag of blocks, if that's when they learn that they pick them up or lose them, when you buy them that uh, you know, iPad, they're not going to leave that out on the rug to see whether or not you take it away from them because they really want that. So they'll know better. But if you don't start this until they've got iPads, you may have to throw an iPad away. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the idea is to start it, start it very early to where you get to the more expensive things as they get older because they don't have expensive things generally when they're little. But if you do that from the beginning, now my daughter's son is now five years old, okay, so he doesn't have iPads and cell phones and those kinds of things yet. 
but he knows that anything that's on that floor when his mom walks into his room that morning and goes in a bag and he'll never see it again. So, and she doesn't, like I say, there's no negativity involved. There's no fussing. I told you to pick that up. You know, it's none of that. It just, she's happy. She's positive with them. She's not annoyed that they left it there. She just picks it up. It's gone. But, so but it's how do you make up good consequences? Like, I mean, with, with the toys, you can say, okay, it's on the ground, I take it away because the ground has to be clean. So that's mm -hmm. pretty obvious. But for example, if you say, like, help me pick up the leaves outside, and it's like a task that takes like half an hour if, if everybody's helping, and they're saying, no, I'd rather play with my cell phone. So what would be then? Well, it's, there are times that you help them do things. You know, you help them with their homework, you help them, uh, you know, you take them out to play. Uh, Basketball, you know, you take them places, you do things for them. They depend on you for a lot of things, right? They don't drive cars, they can't get around, they depend on you. Well, if they're not willing to help you, then you're not really willing to do those things for them. They find out that they have to input to get, you know? You have to contribute if you're going to take. So they learn that. So, okay, come help me rake the leaves. No, I don't want to. Well, then we're not going to be able to go out later and, you know, play those pinball machines or go to the park or, you know, all the things that you do with them that they would like to do. So if you can't help me, then I'm too busy. I'm going to be too busy to, uh, to do those other things. And they'll just have to decide. So they say, no, nah, I don't want to, I want to play. They say, okay, but uh, if you're not interested in, in working with us, you know, being a part of this effort, this is a family thing, it's the family yard, it's the house, if you're not part of the team, then you're on your own, okay? And then when they want to go someplace, it's like, well, you're not part of the team. Why should I take you out to this? Because you're not really part of this team. You're on your own. That's your choice. You see, that sort of thing. So there's always ways to give them choices and give them consequences so that they realize that if they want, they're going to have to help. They're going to have to pitch in and do things that you want. And you're going to pitch in and do the things that they want. But you also may want to do things that they want that you don't want to do. Like they may want to go to the pinball plaza, right, where it's noisy to the point that, you know, you can't even stay in there very long. So you take them, say, okay, you guys help me with the leaves, and uh, I'll help you do this thing you really want to do. And you may have to stand outside or sit there with your plugs while they go in and play in one of these arcades and uh, let them have their fun. And that's something they really want to do. Not just something that they sort of want to do a little maybe, but something they really want to do. Something that's fun for them. Computer games and arcades are fun for children in the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten range. To do something really neat that otherwise you might want to not take them to an arcade. You might say, nah, let's not do that. That's not such a good thing. But if it's what they really want to do, that's worth raking leaves for. So you just kind of let them know that uh, hey, we either we're a team or we're not a team. We work together. You know, we're all a household. Our house is full of leaves. The leaves will kill the grass. Do you want to play in dirt and mud? And if they go, hey, not my problem. It's your job, Dad. You know, I don't do leaves and grass. That's like parents' job to do that for us. And it's like, well, if that's the way you feel, okay. But I want you to know it's not the parents' job to take you out to the pinball machine place either. Because you got to... And you can tell them, you know, life is just like that, kids. If you don't put something in, you don't get anything back out. You have to, you know, you have to work together with people. So you give them some instruction, and then all you have to do is set up a couple of times where they get bitten by their own choices, and then that's generally they tend to be pretty cooperative. But what you find is they don't resent that. You kind of think that if you do that, they'd resent it. Ah, Dad's tricking me, you know. He's bribing me with pinball machines mm -hmm. to do the... But you might think that, and they might feel that way a little bit in the beginning, but that will go away you'll end up that they're going to be happier and they're going to be more, they'll like you better. You get to the point that the children don't see themselves as, you know, third-class citizens in their own home. Well, we're just the kids. You know, we do what we're told. 
we don't get to do anything fun. But, you know, we have to rake leaves and brush our teeth and clean up our rooms, but they don't see they don't really see the benefits. But once they see how it all structured together and they're a part of it, they like that. They get very positive. And by the time they get to be teenagers, they not only like you, but they trust you because you're a team. You work together. They know you're there to take care of them and help, but they have to be part of the process. And you know, my daughters, both, both of my daughters, daughters are usually harder this way than boys are, but my daughters would come to me and talk to me about dealing with their boyfriends and about, you know, you know, about sexuality and, you know, was it time yet? And this sort of thing. And they just come and talk to me about it. Because we'd always been straightforward with each other. So when they had a problem and they had an issue and they didn't know what to do with it, they actually saw their parents as a useful resource. Which hardly ever happens in families with teenagers. The parents are the enemy. You know, they're the people that are always telling you what to do and how to be. And you don't talk with them. So if you get the kids to to work together, even the, even they get along better. When I was homeschooling them, um, they very within about six months they got to the point that they were helpful to each other instead of seeing as their brothers and sisters as as enemies. You know, because when they were not in homeschool, they were all in a public school, and each one had their own little clique of friends. You know. The little girls had their little girl gangs they hung out with, and the boys had their own friends, and they didn't interact that much with each other. They saw each other as a nuisance. They weren't friends, really. Their friends were elsewhere. Well, once the homeschooled, all that disappeared. They fought terribly for the first six months, and after that, they started helping each other out because that was easier. All of them got along better if they worked together. Right? They found that out. So. After that, we could do things like um, I took all the kids and we just, Pamela and I and, and the, the three younger kids, I have one boy that's older, I have two, two boys, two girls, but one boy is quite a bit older than the other three. And the, the three kids and Pamela and I got in a car and just drove around the country for a month and just went to all the tourist traps and all the sights to see and things to do. And there, with three kids sitting in the back, there was never any fights, never any squabbles, never any arguments. They just got along. They liked each other. They helped each other. They liked their parents. They thought we were cool. You know? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. But that's because they were part, you know, we were all together. We were a team. We worked together because they'd been doing that since they were little. So that makes a difference. You can always find consequences because it's, it's, they are part of a team. They need to be part of They need to see themselves as part of the team. But as long as it's, I make the rules, you do as I say, that's not a team. Mm -hmm. And you can't say, okay, I make the rules, you do as I say. Now what we're going to do today is rake leaves. So get your lazy bodies up and get out there and rake leaves. Well, now they are somewhere between indentured servants and slave labor. <coughs> In their mind, that's the way they see it. And that doesn't make them feel part of a team. That makes them feel separate. So that's the thing. And it has to be very specific. You know, if the child is very, very bright, then they're in more trouble because they, they see bigger pictures. But those pictures are often very distorted. Because they're bright, they don't just kind of go along and, you know, the world isn't just simple like it is for most of the children, it's a lot more complicated because they see things that are connected and whatever, and they have these ideas of how things work, and the ideas are just wrong, but they don't know it. It's because they have a lack of experience. So they, but it's their idea, and they're going to hold on to that until proven otherwise. So to deal with them, you have to honor that perspective they have, not tell them, well, that's stupid. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to say, you have to work with that and say, well, okay, I see how you got that. But um, if you tell them that's not the way it is, they won't like it. But you can say, well, think about this other thing. You know, here's this other aspect of it that, you're, that uh, you should just look at that and see if it agrees. 
with your theory. And mostly they're anxious to do that. And then they'll say, oh, I see. That doesn't fit in to the way I thought it was. And then they'll get a little bigger. My son was like that. Pamela will tell you it was the hardest child to raise ever. But I always thought he was delightful to raise. But he would get his mind wrapped around things in such a way that he would come up with ridiculous conclusions. But you just had to work with that conclusion and let him experience his own way out of it. You know, for example, they were young, uh, six, seven years old, maybe about that. And uh, I live in the woods. And there were some raccoons that were up on the porch. And the kids saw them, hey, Dad, Mom, look. And I told them, I said, those are raccoons. They're not cats. And they are wild. And you should watch them through the window. You can't go out and grab one or pet one. You know, that would not be appropriate. They have sharp teeth and claws. and they're not particularly friendly with people. So watch them through the window, and uh, that's fine. Well, three or four days later, we, my children are in the car, and my son realized that those are raccoons that live in the woods. And, uh, you know, we live in the woods. So we pull the car in, and we park it. And because we live in the woods, where we park, you open the door, and then there's a little woods on the other side. He refused to get out of the car. It was dark. Raccoons live in the woods. They're not friendly. They have teeth and claws. I'm not getting out of that car right there next to that woods in the dark where I can't see it. So he just fought the tears. He would not get out of the car. He was standing there. You know, so what do you, what do, you do? You know, well, you have to talk with him and say, well, okay, I'll check the woods and see if there's any raccoons there. Of course, there's no raccoons. Our car just pulled in. If there are any raccoons within 50 feet, they'd be hiding somewhere. But he doesn't understand that. So you have to just work with him instead of saying, that's stupid, kid. Get out of the car. Grab him, you know, drag him out of the car. That's the wrong answer. The answer is to make them feel better about it and then discuss the idea and say, well, you know, raccoons try to avoid us if they can. But if you corner one, It'll fight. But if you don't corner one, it'll run away. And then they got a new piece of information that I never mentioned. So you deal with bright children a little differently because they do see this bigger world. They make up things. They find dangers and things that frighten them. My boy once got to a stream. It was a boy out hiking in the woods. There was this little stream. It was probably that wide and that deep. <laughs> It was just a little runoff because it had rained recently and it was running right across the trail. And he had gotten in class the week before a lecture about flooding and the danger of streams overflowing. <laughs> and the teacher told them that little streams that generally were looked pretty safe could suddenly turn into roaring turrets that would, you know, wash everything away. And that's what happened, you know. And the reason the teacher was telling them that, because that previous week that happened in our area. We had lots and lots of rain, and it killed a half a dozen people, and swept away bridges and cars, and you know, it was a real big disaster. So the teacher, because it was all in the news, so the teacher was talking to him about it. There were flash floods, and here's what happened. Well, he just thinks too much. So he gets to this little stream. Like I say, you, know, you could step over it. He couldn't. You know, an adult could step over it. And he would not cross it because any minute in his mind, it could turn into a rushing torrent of water and you know, wipe him away because he knew that that's what happened to little streams sometimes. He didn't have a big enough picture to get the rain and it hadn't been raining that much recently and so on. So that was a, that was a problem. It took us a long time to get him across that stream. And I finally had to pick him up and carry him across the stream, convincing that he wouldn't get washed away. But he was terrified. He thinks too much, you know, that's the thing. The other children, they just walk across, since it's a stream, you know, they don't have all those issues because they don't think that much about their environment. So very particularly bright kids are 
you have to work with them differently. And you can't just push them. You have to take the time to deal with their perspective. But it all goes away. I mean, he gets, it, uh, he was, uh, he, Pamela was worried that he, he was having anger management problems because his sisters, there was a boy and he had two, two sisters, one on either side, one younger, one older. And of course the two girls would team up and get their brother. And he would get really angry. And Pamela said, should we take him someplace to you know, deal with that anger? And I said, no, he'll just outgrow it. He'll, he'll see that it's not productive. And he did. He's the most laid back kid there ever was. But he uh, had trouble because he was at a young enough age where things were either right or not right. Right and wrong was very black and white. And what they were doing was wrong, period. And it needed to change, you know, and it didn't change. His sisters were having a lot of fun, and he'd get angry. But he grew up and realized that you know, the world wasn't black and white, and he needed to be a, a little more, uh, a little wider uh, acceptance of other people and the way they were. So. So you can generally find things like that to do with children, to make them part of the team. And they'll like it. And they'll like each other and they'll like you. And it really will be a family rather than a, you know, the, the, uh, the ones in power and the ones that are, you know, what is it, uh, prisoners and guards. You know, it won't devolve into a prisoners and guards mentality, which is typically the way it, it does. So that would be the advice. So that's what I mean by respecting their, mm -hmm. respecting them, and not just telling them what to do, but make a situation to where they get to choose, but they have consequences. And the consequences have to be related to the same thing. You know, you can't just have a consequence like do what I say, or the consequences are I'm going to smack you. You know, <laughs> that's not a related consequence. That's just power. I'm big, you're small, you have to do what I say. They resent that. So it's uh, the consequence is that if you don't help me, I won't help you. You need help with your homework. You need help because they give you transportation to, you know, to go play with your friends or something. Well, you know, I'm busy doing other things. I got other things to do. I, you know, it's, I have to go out of my way to put you in the car and take you over to your friend's house. So if you're not willing to help me, then I'm not really willing to help you if you're not part of the team, then that's a consequence that's, that's part of you know, the same thing rather than just a consequence of being smacked. If they don't, you know, in my family, you had to eat the food on your plate. And when it came to seconds, you had choice. Eat this or not eat that. But when it came to firsts, the food was put on your plate. And there were no seconds until all the firsts were done, period. And if you didn't want to eat something, that was fine. You didn't have to eat it, but that was the end of the food. Eat it or go hungry, you know, that was the thing. So you weren't forced to eat it, but you didn't get anything else. It wasn't a substitute. Oh, you don't like broccoli? Okay, let me give you some tater tots. You know, it wasn't like that. You don't like broccoli? Sorry. You got what's on your plate. And if you were done, you could leave. <laughs> and no, there were no snacks in between. You couldn't go eat something else. That was it till the next meal. So you could pass up your stuff if you wanted, but then you ended up with less food than you'd like to eat. And the next meal was likely to be the same, maybe worse. <laughs> and the next meal may have had twice as much broccoli on it, you know, and, and less of the other stuff. Who knows, you know, but you just, got, that was the rule. So it was simple. You didn't have to eat it, but you wouldn't get anything else in its place. And the idea was you were always obligated to try everything. You couldn't just not like it because it didn't look good. I can't eat that, it's green. You know, you get that sort of thing. But no, you had to at least eat some of it. But if you just really didn't like it, okay. 
There'll be another meal, you know, in five hours, you'll get another chance. But that meal, again, was the same thing that was being cooked for everybody. It wasn't a special meal for you, and it also had its grains, and it had its, you know, carbohydrates, and it had whatever. It had the meal that was served, and you had the same option. And it wasn't like large portions were put on their plate of the things you liked or anything. You got the, the appropriate portions of everything. So there's ways to have consequences that, with that, that are not punitive, but just, look, we cooked this meal for you. You're not old enough to cook your own meal. No, you're not allowed to cook your own meal. You, know, you don't know enough, you make a mess, you set the house on fire, you know, that's not appropriate yet, so we're going to make a healthy meal for you. And like it or lump it, I guess. And if the consequences are more than just one time, if they are like for the, ch for the child because of her decision are continuous, um, like, like for example, um, my younger daughter, she's born on the 28th of, of September and that's kind of like right at the limit where you decide uh, if it's put into this year's class or one in your bag. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if she was born on the 1st of October, she would be one grade below. Mm -hmm. And um, the school system in Germany, they reduced the, the time from nine years to eight years, so everything kind of like moved down one year again. So I know from the learning theory, sometimes if your brain isn't developed right, it takes you longer to learn something than if you were like a year older, you grasp the concept a lot faster and easier. Right. And um, my older daughter is the same, she's born on the 30th of, of September. So she made the decision, I'm, I'm going, when we moved back from Spain, she made the decision, I'm going back one year. And now she is having an easy time. And my younger daughter said, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to stay there. So although they're two years apart, they're just one grade apart in school. And now my younger daughter is really struggling and, and she's, she's like, the, the teachers were even saying like, you might be overextended, maybe you should go one year back. And of course, the longer she stays with her classmates, the more connected she gets to them as friends, right. but the longer she has to struggle. So now we're kind of like uh, between a rock and a hard place to, to decide, should we force her one year back so she has it a lot easier? Um, and doesn't have to struggle that much, or should we kind of like let her live with the consequences and she has to really put in not the extra mile, but probably the extra 10 miles to keep up with the others. May I say something? I'm studying to become a teacher. This is a known phenomena, and they grow out of it by the fifth or sixth grade. Yeah, the she's in sixth grade now. The difference turns over. There's the break-even point, and after that the difference isn't so much because the brain has, um, how do you call it, fossilized these things, they've become, uh, they've evened out, to say, and after that it gets easier. It's the so once she manages to get to sound spread, yes. she's fine? Or? That's, that's, her brain is developed enough okay. not to make the difference so, so great. Yeah, it gets easier. I was one of those. I was always the youngest kid in my class. Always. I, when I went to college, I was 17. Because I was just the youngest kid in the class. It wasn't that I got there early or skipped anything. I just was where my birthday was. And uh, I found that it was always a struggle. Things were always difficult. I had to work harder than, uh, than some of the others had to. But I did work harder, and eventually, you're right, it doesn't make any difference you get to a point where that disappears. But for me, it probably disappeared somewhere more like in the, in the um, what would it be, uh, ninth grade? Eighth, ninth, tenth, somewhere in the high school range. It started to disappear and didn't really make much difference anymore. But it is a, you give and you get on that. You know, if, if you're a, if you're in a grade, if you don't start it, it's hard to back up later, because then it's not so much that you're going back a grade and you have different friends. It's that you've failed. You're not good enough. You couldn't make it. So suddenly you have this mindset of failure, unable to make it, not smart enough, and just believing you're not smart enough can do more damage to you than having to struggle. So you do, you're between a rock and a hard place there. You see there's going to be 
difficulty either way. If you go forwards, you're constantly going to be struggling. If you go backwards, you're going to feel like a failure. Which one of those is the least damaging? Yeah, you know, exactly. you'd have to. You know, and if the child themselves say, "I don't want to go back," then she's still going to run into her friends. He said, "Now they're all going to point their fingers at her and laugh at her because she was too dumb and had got put back." They probably won't do that, but that's what she's thinking in her mind that they are going to do. And some of them will do that because kids are pretty self-centered and not nice to each other a lot. So that's the balancing thing, and that's a tough one because it's going to hurt either either way. Well, one thing would be to give her more support in going forward. If she doesn't want to go backward, if she thinks that would be a tr more trauma, it probably would be. Then maybe you find tutors, you find people who will, you know, help her with things. Um, she, you may, she may understand that I'm going to have to work a little harder because I'm a little younger. She's ambitious, so she's yeah, so she, willing to do that. If working hard isn't the problem, but I just don't want her. To be her school time, be a constant struggle, like right. Well, if she gets tutors that will help her understand things, that may help mm -hmm. because one on one teaching is a whole lot more effective than you know, one on 30 teaching or one on 20 teaching. You're going to learn a lot more in a short amount of time if it's a one on one teaching, and if the teacher's good and not just teaching them how to crank out right answers but how to think, you know, how to how to solve problems, how to work with this, how do you work with this math or with the social studies or whatever it is, you know, what's important about it and helps them that way. If it's really a good tutor, then that may make it easier. She'd have that advantage that would help get her up to speed. And as, as a parent, you can work with them, helping them with homework, helping them, uh, not just helping them get the homework done, but helping them with the ideas and the understanding required for them to do it. If you just help them get it done, that's not that helpful. You need to help them learn how to figure you know, the process out so they can do it themselves, which takes some time. But my, one of my things I did with my children was made sure that they could write well. So we had a lot of writing assignments. And they'd sometimes have to do, be like the 10th draft you know, but we just kept doing it. They didn't like it for a while, but afterwards they really enjoyed it because they were good writers. They could write well and they could then get creative with their writing and all of that was pleasing to them. But in the beginning it was difficult. It didn't seem to make sense, but we just kept working at it. But you can do things like that that will help her be ahead when she gets there. So that, if she doesn't want to go back, I can see that may be traumatic and she may never get over it. 20 years later, she still may feel like a failure because of that. Those things can stick with you. So it's a pretty serious downside. Maybe a worse downside than the upside. Depends on her personality. Some kids would say, nah, okay, I'll go back. It'll be easier and, and that's okay because they're not that worried about the, their peers and what their peers think of them. You know, my son was like, a, he couldn't care less what anybody thought of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were older like that as well, but yeah. the younger was yeah. just different. So. But yeah, if they're different and what their peers think of them is a very important thing to them, then that is very important. So you would say respect the wish of an 11-year-old at that point, even if she has to kind of like go the extra mile yeah. for the next five years? I would think so. I'd respect that because she probably knows herself pretty well. If that's going to be a crushing blow. Now the other thing you could do, of course, is change schools. But I don't know how, to, how you work here, but that would be, that's difficult where I live because you have to change where you live. You'd actually have to move someplace. But if you can change schools, then she can change to a different school at a lower, you know, take the same grade again at a different school where nobody knows her. Then she's fine. The social thing is, is gone. So then it would only be in her own mind does she feel dumb, does she feel like a failure. That's probably not so much of a problem. It's probably what, the, or what her peers think of her that's the real big problem. Mm -hmm. So putting her in a different school would solve the peer problem. There wouldn't be any peers who would laugh at her because she'd just go into that school and nobody knows particularly how old you are or whatever and you can just go in and work and suddenly it'd be a lot easier. And you just give her that as an option. So, you know, we could change schools 
you can make new friends. You know, within three or four months, you'd have a whole bunch of new friends, and you'd get along fine, and she might not be able to let go of her friends, or she might. But how old is she? Uh, Eleven. Yeah. You should probably respect her choices okay. at 11, pretty much, instead of make her do something. If she were in third grade or something, you could be a lot more forceful, and it would be okay. But 11 years old, they have a sense of what's important to them. And those emotional traumas are just as bad, sometimes worse than the extra work that it takes. But it will right itself eventually. But it may be a while. You just don't want her to come out scarred to where it ruins the rest of her life. Well, it wouldn't ruin it, but that it's a drag on the rest of her life. That would be the worst thing. Yeah, I struggled through, through uh, school for a while, but the time I was in, uh, you know, junior or senior in high school, it didn't make any difference at all. The time I got to college, it really didn't make much difference at all.